I'm Heather. Uh, Caitlin and I today will be taking you uh, from the cloud to the ground. Uh, the idea here being that uh, with the advent of RDA, there's a lot of theory behind RDA, that, uh, that nasty Ferber thing. Um, so I'll be starting with a brief history of cataloging and the move from AACR2 to RDA, followed by a look at the future of cataloging in a linked data environment. And Caitlin will then bring us back down to the ground um, on a more practical level uh, with uh, several res resources showing how to communicate um, RDA changes uh, which are relevant uh, to public services staff. So starting off, what, what is a catalog? A complete list of items, typically one in alphabetical order um, or other systematic order, in particular a list of all the books or resources in a library. And a catalog really has three parts. It has the data, which is what we really want to record. It has, uh, which is currently in AACR2 um, or RDA. Um, it has the record, how we contain that data, how we keep it together for each resource. And then it has the search interface, which we use to search the record so that we can ultimately get back at that data. So a very quick history of cataloging through the data and the record. You can see that through time, uh, the data itself hasn't changed that much. So in my hypothetical small library, uh, which contains Anne of Green Gables by Ellen Montgomery, the way that they've uh, recorded the data for Ellen Montgomery's name hasn't actually changed that much over time. But the, the way that it's been recorded, the record that it's been placed in, has changed. So in 1908, when it was published, uh, they very well might not have had a record for um, the book or for Ellen Montgomery. It might have been just in the librarian's head or there on the shelf uh, to browse. Um, then it would have developed into a list of items on paper, then maybe a list arranged by author, updated every one or two years. Um, then we got index cards and card catalogs. Um, and then in the 70s, we really moved over to the MARC record format. So that information would have been contained in the 100 field. We then developed authority records. Um, and then we moved from AACR2 to RDA. But really, here uh, this makes a distinction that the data is about the description of the data and the record is that physical format. So enter Ferber and the new way to think. Um, so this is really how we think about our collections. Uh, and I, I find it interesting that this still kind of has this focus for the cataloger, that those big, big boxes of work, expression, manifestation, item are still, much, still so focused on the thing, whereas Ferber and RDA are really focused on the relationships. How is the item in front of you related to everything else? And the, the, to me, it seems kind of smaller that those relationships, the work is realized through the expression. The expression is embodied in the manifestation. Manifestation is exemplified by the item. Um, those relationships are really where um, this uh, change of philosophy comes in, recording those relationships in RDA. So a little bit more illustrative example of that work expression manifestation item. Uh, the work is the idea here of Anne of Green Gables there floating above Ellen Montgomery's head. So if I ask you, have you read Anne of Green Gables? I'm not referring to a particular item or manifestation or expression. I'm referring to the work, the concept of the story which in an interesting philosophical wrinkle means a perfectly valid response from you would be, no, I haven't read it, but I have seen the miniseries. Thus you would acknowledge being familiar with the work, but through the expression of the miniseries, not the expression of the written text. When my colleague Stacy looked at this slide, she said, oh, I remember having the book with the green border. Um, she was talking about a particular manifestation of the story Anne of Green Gables. It's still the same text as the original printed expression, but printed by a different publisher. However, she read the item 
that is still on our bookshelf at home and has not read either copy one or copy two of the items in uh, the Munn Library's collection. So what's the difference between AACR2 and RDA on a theoretical level? Um, AACR2 is about rules. It's there in the name. You have to follow the rules. Um, it was started as a North American effort. It was intended for use by libraries. Um, when AACR was originally developed, they were working with monographs, single books. Um, it is all about the description, describing the item in front of you. It would describe a single resource. It relies on humans to infer relationships, and its ultimate goal is human understanding. Humans have to make the connections between the author and the title and know that those things are related. Resource description and access, uh, they refer to themselves as instructions and guidelines. So there's a lot of room for catalogers' judgment here. It started as an international effort, and it's really intended for use by everyone, though whether museums and archives uh, actually pick up on using RDA, we have yet to see. Um, it is WEMI based. It's ba based around those uh, relationships um, between work expression manifestation item. It's about description and access, again, referring back to the name. Um, it describes a resource and its relationships to its creators and other works. Um, and its ultimate goal is machine understanding. And I put a question mark there because um, I do believe that RDA is uh, working us toward the goal of machine understanding, um, but I would really question as to whether it's there So is it actually different? Um, on a day-to-day -day basis, a lot has changed, but a lot has stayed the same. So comparing an AACR2 record with an RDA record side by side, um, there are some obvious differences. Um, you know, we've, we've got those words that are spelled out, P period becomes pages, um, et cetera. Um, and then the 264 is one of the more significant changes. The, the 260 has been eliminated and information within the 260 has been broken down into four different uh, 264 um, fields. Another big difference is, are the 336, 337, 338. I'm sure you've all heard about the uh, disappearing of the general material designator, the string H from the 245. Um, it's meant to be replaced with the um, 336, 337, and 338 in this kind of more coded, uh, more machine-friendly looking format. Um, but ultimately, everything in an RDA mark record is still in text strings. And these text strings are typed in by humans. So one of the changes from RDA is uh, in the, that first 264, instead of having an S period, L period to indicate that it's without a location, we say place of publication not identified. And that string is typed in by a human. So remember AACR2, RDA like AACR2 before it only tells catalogers how to describe a resource. It does not speak as to how that description should be entered into the MARC record or any other format for that matter. RDA certainly has advanced our ability to describe the relationships among works, expressions, and manifestations. These are just a few examples um, from RDA. So you can have a indicate that something's a derivative work, that it contains a work, it's a translation of, an abridgment of, an augmentation of. Um, and again, these are just a few examples. There are um, hundreds that you can choose from. So is RDA a step toward linked data? Does it move us any closer? In terms of authority records, yes, I think that RDA does. Um, and this is a little bit hard to see, but the AACR2 record on the left, you can see it's uh, significantly shorter than the RDA authority record on the right. 
So the focus of the AACR2 record is that unique uh, string in the 100 because we, uh, we still validate on that um, text string. The RDA record has taken a lot more information about the author and broken it out into separate fields. So um, in particular, I'd like to bring your attention to the 046, which is a place where we can code in um, birth and death dates. For authors. So now with RDA, you can search authority records much as you might have previously searched bibliographic records. For example, I could do a search for female biologists born after 1946 who publish in English. And just in the past few months, um, I've been really happy to see a few authority records with 024 fields added for identifiers from the Virtual International Authority file and other linked data sources. So what are the next steps for the record? Currently, the authorities in our bibliographic records validate on text strings. And again, these text strings are typed in by humans. And so there's this huge margin for error. Are you horrified by this at all? <laughs> because I am. <laughs> Rather than typing in our authorized fields, we should have drop-down lists in our cataloging interfaces. So we can select an authorized term, and in the background, the system should be adding in a URI. In 2013, with the amount of progress the rest of the world has already made toward linked data, catalogers should no longer be typing in as much data as we do. So here's a really kind of crazy secret. Um, subfield zero, is a valid subfield for identifiers within the Mark 21 format, but it's only supposed to be uh, it's only supposed to accept a very specific type of identifier, which is actually not linked data friendly. In one of her blog posts, uh, Karen Coyle suggests that we disobey that rule and start entering HTTP URIs from Library of Congress um, authorities, and I think that's a great idea because it supplies the missing link in our library linked data. The library world is actually a lot closer to um, linked data than I think a lot of us realize. We already have HTTP URIs as names for all LCSH and LC authorities, and those URIs are already linked to other URIs. So what's holding us back is that until we can bring those links into our bibliographic records, we're still working in the web of linked documents, flat mark records, rather than in the semantic web of linked data. So is this an issue about the record or the system as a whole? For better or worse, we're moving ahead with RDA. RDA day one was March 31, 2013, and I don't think we're turning back. Um, I've gotten the impression that outside the um, cataloging world, at least, some librarians even think that uh, RDA means that we've moved to linked data. Um, but hopefully you realize that's not the case, um, and we still have some major decisions to make. So again, remember RDA is only about the description, ensuring that we're all describing our resources in the same way. It does not speak to how that description should be entered into a MARC record, nor how the description should be handled by our systems. So can MARC 21 be adapted to handle linked data? To me, um, when I'm working with RDA and MARC, the term shoehorning often comes to mind. RDA description looks awkward in a MARC record. And to me, that may be an indication that we need to move to something other than a MARC record format, but what then do we do with our legacy data of millions of records? So looking at the ILS, is the answer then to move to a next generation catalog, a system in the cloud? All the ones that I've seen uh, still have a flat MARC record at their core. And this also brings in other questions. Um, a next generation catalog will likely have one best in class component, but can't possibly be best in class for all its other components. So do we replace our ILS with something different? Do we stick with what we have? Um, do we just work on making the cataloging component of our systems into linked data? Um, do we even consider uh, creating our own systems from the ground up?
So um, linked data, we all know uh, subject, predicate, object. We want to take it from Anne of Green Gables, has author Ellen Montgomery, and replace those with HTTP URIs. So there are um, plenty of resources uh, for our subjects and objects, LC Linked Data Services, um, VOF. Um, but what about the predicates? What about the middle part? So enter the open metadata registry. The metadata registry hosts over 300 vocabularies, including 116 for Mark 21 format and 70 RDA-based vocabularies, as well as several element sets containing thousands of elements for both MARC and RDA. These are already there, they're established, they have the URIs, they're just waiting to be used. So as a quick example, this is the author work element from the element set RDA roles, which I just used in my um, RDF triple example. So from what I've seen, at least one of the next generation catalogs can provide drop down lists for authorized access points. But I don't know if those connect to URIs in the background of the system. I kind of suspect that they don't. Otherwise, except from putting all library technical services together in one package, which simplifies our payment structure, and moving to the cloud, um, all these systems that I've seen are still based on that flat mark record and none of the other data in these systems is linked. Do we even want vendors creating our um, linked open data systems or is this something that we'd like to take control of for ourselves? So how about Bibframe? Uh, Bibframe is LC's answer to the postmark record. It is based in RDF triples, but it's still a long way from being a viable replacement. And again, what do we do with our legacy mark records? Um, we're going to have to crosswalk them to the BibFrame format. What data will be saved? What data will be lost? Um, the extensible catalog, XC, um, I think uh, from a cataloging perspective at least, there are some really exciting possibilities here. Um, the extensible catalog offers tools for experimentation with MARC and other library metadata. Um, it has potential for the bulk creation of linked data in three different ways, RDF XML, RDFA, and Sparkle. Um, and it's also a platform for the development of other linked data tools um, to create new opportunities. So RIMF is RDA in many metadata formats. Um, it's not actually a cataloging tool or system, um, but rather it's a way to play with RDA description in a Ferber environment. Although, um, if cataloging in the future is going to focus on a Ferber structure, um, how we enter cataloging data could certainly have more of this kind of look and would emphasize entering that new um, work expression manifestation item information only once. So will there ever be a postmark environment? Every now and again, we run across bibliographic records created in the early 1970s. Mark has lasted a long time. Is it time to get rid of it? Or can we find a new way to leverage what's turned out to be an incredibly durable format? And finally, are there other options? Do we really want to wait for someone else to develop a linked data solution um, for our catalogs for us? As librarians, what do we want the future catalog experience to be for our users? In many ways, I think the catalog is almost going to disappear from notice. Just like this cloud we're all familiar with, we know library linked data is included here, but it's hard to pick out exactly where. LCSH and LC authorities are part of this cloud, but that really doesn't do much for our users until we can get those LC URIs in our bibliographic records. Imagine our data linked to LC URIs, linked to VOF, linked to Wikipedia, linked to DBpedia, and we're there. Our users will probably know at which point they enter the cloud of linked data, but they'll quickly lose track of exactly where they are. Applications will allow them to view and search the semantic web, which libraries will be a part of, however they choose. 
Google already um, leverages linked data in some great ways. Uh, as you all know, uh, everything on the right side of the screen um, is linked data pulled from different sources. So whenever I look at this, I always think, how could our MARC record data enhance what's already right here? Once we start adding URIs to the data in our bibliographic records, it's only one more link to go directly to specific content. So this is a site called Small Demons, which begins to illustrate this idea. This is the Small Demons page for the Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown. Um, so it provides some obvious links there uh, to the series, the author, the movie. But then it also shows other books that mention the Da Vinci Code. So this is books referring to books. And further down the page, it shows music mentioned in the book and people mentioned in the book. And it also shows that it's found in collections of books that members of the site have created. I see a possibility here for a massive amount of personalization for our users. It will come to the point that our catalogs will be an afterthought as users link directly to our data and integrate it into larger apps for whatever purposes they can imagine. So what can we do now? Um, read, join listservs, ask questions. I get the sense that this group is really good at doing that. Um, there's been a lot published in the past few months on um, linked data and catalogs um, and possibilities of moving forward. Talk with your colleagues, with administrators, um, with vendors. Um, play, there's the extensible catalog. There are uh, so many local linked data projects coming up. Um, RIMP is uh, also certainly a possibility. Share what you know, find out what others know. Um, I'm really happy to be at Access this year. Be a rebel, add um, URIs to the MARC subfield zero, and of course, find other ways to convert MARC records to linked open data. Philip Skur is a librarian at Stanford, and he's the current chair of the Program for Cooperative Cataloging uh, Policy Committee. In April 2012, he had this to say. Although a daunting challenge, this conversion of our bibliographic records from MARC to linked open data will become one of the most powerful drivers in the transformation to the semantic web, placing our data and resources where people are actually looking for it and tying them intelligently to the wealth of the web. Thanks. All right, so I am going to uh, hop out of the catalog and hop into the library with the people. <laughs> um, you know, I find it really easy to like shut the door to my office and hop into the catalog and make all kinds of changes that really impact users. And it's really easy to remember when you shut the door that there are users at the other end of these changes. And it's almost like cooking a giant turkey dinner for Thanksgiving and not inviting anybody over. So invite the people over and teach them how to use tools like RDA. And the best way to do that, even before implementing RDA at your institution, is to train reference librarians on what RDA changes will be made. And I would like to emphasize that it's really important to do this before you implement RDA, not after. Otherwise, you're inviting people over for turkey after you've cooked the turkey. So what I'm going to talk about today is the to the ground portion of this presentation um, about how to develop a training strategy for RDA in your library, some common changes that are occurring that are cross-disciplinary that aren't format specific, and some, some really solid examples that I like to use when talking about RDA to non-metadata folk. Um, so in bringing these changes down to the ground, it's making metadata useful to the end user. And so if anybody looks at RDA online or even just Googles it, uh, you'll find that there's a lot of information out there that's not organized in a very librarian-y way. <laughs> so um, there's a lot of risk for information overload, especially for non-metadata professionals. So not just all this information that exists, but that it's irrelevant information for, for the crowd. So in developing a training strategy for public services professionals, it's really important to strip down the stuff that's irrelevant to them because they either maybe you won't understand it because that's not necessarily their field of expertise, um, or because it just has nothing to do with the record that they see. 
So generally my rule is if I'm developing training for public services staff is to say, do, does this really need to be there? Is this really important? So the first really important part to developing an RDA training strategy is explaining what RDA is. So we're kind of lucky that right now RDA has been around long enough that pretty much everybody knows what it is. Um, so we don't have that initial shock um, of explaining, hey, this is RDA. But there's still um, a huge level of importance in developing some type of context for what RDA is. So just saying it's the new way that we're cataloging or it's kind of like AACR3, that's not good enough. <laughs> if you don't provide any context, A, people aren't going to care and B, they're not going to understand. So this is my favorite way to explain RDA. Get ready. So you'll see we have two buildings here and they both have foundations. So the building on the left is a house and it's got a shallow foundation. And I compare it to the way libraries were when I was a young person. And there, and it is, <laughs> and it is a lot like uh, a house. And we all, as libraries, had our own houses and our own shallow foundations because that was all we needed. We weren't linked the same way that we're linked now. And if we needed something, we could go to our neighbor and borrow it, ILL. Um, but other than that, we were fine having just our shallow foundation. But now we kind of share things more. We live in more of a building like on the right. We m might be a condo. We might share a gym and a pool. And we're all linked. And in order to build up, we need to be able to have a deeper foundation down. So even though we might not be building up, we still might be using Mark, for example, and won't be able to, to build up further while we're still in Mark, we won't be able to build up and get rid of Mark unless we build down and um, implement RDA. So we're building a sound structure so that we can develop more. And if we don't, then you get cracks in our foundation, and that's really bad. <laughs> and then your house gets wonky. <laughs> or your tower leans. And I, I use the Leaning Tower Fees example because um, it's really expensive for them to keep this thing up. They have to fix it all the time because the foundation isn't built properly for what the building is. And so if we want expensive catalog fixes, um, then this is exactly what we should do. <laughs> or we could also just self-destruct. Um, so my second example that I like to give is uh, context for why RDA. So the first uh, kind of scale up here is a spectrum that goes from cataloging resources to users. And there's a tension between these two things because we can really make things user focused, even in AACR2, but it takes a lot of time and it takes a lot of money. And that's why we had things like the rule of three in AACR2 is because it just takes time and it takes resources to uh, put in more than three uh, 700 fields. Um, so at first I used to think that it's this green AACR2 in RDA would be closer to the users just to, that it would slide. But what RDA really does is it shortens the spectrum up. It doesn't make us closer to the users because it's inherently closer to the users. It's because it's inherently closer to what we're trying to get to where there's no more tension between the resources and the users. That's what technology lets us do. Um, so the hybrid environment is what we're going to, what we're living in now, essentially, where records coexist. We have AACR2 records, RDA records, and hybrid records that have elements of both. Um, and my favorite example to explain this is um, the book scroll and the codex. So the book scroll is how words used to be written on paper and how they used to be read. And they're cool, but they're not easy to store and they break easily and you have to rewind your books and nobody likes that. So they develop the codex, which is com comparable to the modern day book. And even though it's easier to store and easier to preserve and um, you don't have to rewind it, it coexisted with the book scroll in the same way for hundreds of years. And though I don't think AACR2 and RDA will necessarily coexist for hundreds of years, um, it's the same idea where uh, it will be a long while before one supplants the other. So moving on uh, on how to identify RDA records, uh, generally in training public services staff, um, there's a lot of ways that we identify RDA records as metadata professionals that 
you can't expect that anybody who doesn't work in metadata would know how to find them. Um, so the highlighted portions here are the easiest that you show up really great on this screen, but not so great on this one. Um, are really the easiest ways to tell if something's an RDA record right off the bat. So, for example, uh, in the author field, um, there's related terms identified as author and illustrator. And in the description, the word pages is spelled out in full. Um, illustrations and color are, are spelled out in full. And those are really key indicators that this probably isn't an AACR2 record. And it's important for public services librarians to know that these are not are not AACR2 records, so that they have some context for how to interpret the records going forward. Also, if you have advanced users, you can have them uh, change the display. So in this example, the librarians view, but in some uh, catalogs, it's the mark viewer that change display. And then you can point them to things like uh, the 264 field that exists, the 33678, um, if they maybe have catalogs in the past, you could point them towards the 040E field, but that's generally, generally probably won't happen for you. Um, so once they've identified that it's an RDA record, then you can start giving them some context to how things are going to change in that record. Um, for example, uh, impact on search and browse. So specifically for headings, um, the most most common question that I get from reference librarians is about the Bible. Um, Bible headings are changing, um, but the way that you search doesn't need to change too, too much to, uh, to make up for this. So in AACR2, it used to be, uh, for LC subject headings, is that there'd be the Bible, and then there'd be this added part for OT or NT, if it was the Older New Testament, and then the book of the Bible. It's not happening anymore. It's just going to be Bible and then the book of the Bible. So the example here is Leviticus. It's going from Bible OT Leviticus to just Bible Leviticus. The only, way, the only time that we would um, specify whether it's Old or New Testament in the subject heading is if it's actually that the, old, the whole Old Testament of the whole New Testament or some collections of books they're from. Um, so the easiest way... Uh, to optimize search in this environment is to search with and without the testament abbreviation while we're still living in the hybrid environment. And so it's, I realize that it's sometimes frustrating to have to say you have to search two terms instead of one because that makes it seem like it maybe isn't easier, but it's part of building that foundation so that going forward things will get better. Um, there are also abbreviations that won't exist anymore in LC subject headings. For example, um, the first two come from music subject headings where arranged will be spelled out, unaccompanied will be spelled out. Uh, department will now be spelled out and that's a retroactive change so that should be ubiquitous but it, de it really depends on resources. Um, so the easiest thing to do is to search both terms or use a truncated search. Um, and the browse shouldn't necessarily change too much because they appear so close in alphanumeric array that it, um, they should appear close to each other in browse. Um, there are also some changes in terminology in library, uh, library of Congress subject headings. Um, one big one is the Quran will now be, has now a standard spelling where it didn't before. So the spelling on the right is now the correct spelling in RDA. Um, also the violin cello, which is a word that nobody uses, <laughs> is now being called the cello in music. So um, for violin cello, you can use a truncated search and for the Quran, um, you can use you can use um, both terms. Um, so there's also going to be impact on record interpretation. So the subject headings really impact the way that people search, but the more day-to-day -day tasks will be record interpretation, which won't change all that much. And so when you tell people that, emphasize that, because it's really scary to think that every record that you're ever going to have to interpret for your frontline job with students um, is going to be different. But it will be different better. It will be different in a way that makes it better. So since there's an emphasis on transcription, we're getting rid of Latin, we're getting rid of abbreviations, and we're replacing them with common words that everybody uses and everybody can understand. Um, also the 260 field is being replaced by the 264, so instead of having just 
the publication info as it appeared in the 260, we can now um, distinguish between the functions, uh, copyright, publisher, uh, distribution date, for example. Also, one thing to note is that the dates that appear in Roman numerals in materials will be written out now as Roman numerals still, so like MC, M, X, I, I, whatever. So that might be one change in interpretation that will require librarians to know how to, how to read Roman numerals. But we all learned that, right, in grade two? There's also in-record terminology changes, but most of these are specific to uh, format. So if you're training uh, music librarians, for example, or um, visual and performing arts librarians, it'll be really important to hit on these, but if you're not, you can probably just leave it as a side note and it won't affect you too much. Um, so specifically in music, videos, and art, and here are some examples, but I'm kind of running low on time. Finally, uh, illustrating Ferber. So Ferber are the functional requirements for bibliographic records, and um, even as a metadata professional, at first I found these to be um, really ideologically confusing, and I maybe that's just me, but I feel like if I were a reference professional and somebody threw Ferber at me, I would be angry about it. So, <laughs> so I feel like the best way to illustrate Ferber is to just pull up a catalog record and demonstrate exactly how Ferber is going to work in your catalog. So the way that I generally do it is to open up a record like this, I have gone with the wind, um, and taking the parts out of it and saying which aspects of Ferber they relate to. So Ferber Group 2 uh, is roughly equivalent to our authority, our um, name authorities. Ferber Group 3 is roughly equivalent to our subject authorities. Um, the expression, like making sure that the different parts that actually reference librarians are actually using um, and saying exactly how they're going to be identified in RDA or with Ferber is just, it's a really simple thing to do <laughs> that really will give a lot of context. And so, this is my last slide, I swear. Um, there are more RDA training resources out there. Like I said, they're not organized in a way that's very librarian-y. Um, th there's one in Canada called the RDA Canada Knowledge Exchange, or RDA Cake. And they really have a cake, as you can see. And it's uh, people like us, practitioners, who use their training materials and then throw them up online, and then they're accessible by other professionals. So you can go on. It's um, rdacake.wikispaces.com and you can check it out if you need to implement RDA training or if you're interested in, in it yourself. You can see what other institutions are doing. Um, I've also found the Library of Congress RDA training materials to be helpful. Unfortunately, R Library and Archives Canada doesn't have anything like this, so there's not a lot of context in a Canadian setting, which is unfortunate. Um, however, <laughs> teefing off of the Library of Congress is A-OK. -okay. Um, so they have a lot of training materials as well. And that is it for me. If there are any questions, I don't know if we have time though. Okay. Excellent. I'm just wondering in what context you're giving this RDA training because I, I don't know of any reference librarian who's ever been trained on the the record in the catalog, and I think it's an excellent idea. But like, are you giving classes? Are you? Yeah. So I can give you the context that we're doing it at U of C. I'm sorry for for not providing that in the first place. So we're already receiving RDA records from OCLC. We're receiving them from eBrae. We're receiving them from everywhere. Um, so they're already appearing in the catalog, even ahead of us implementing RDA, um, our catalogers cataloging in RDA. So before we roll out RDA, we're doing a training session. We have training Thursdays at the University of Calgary Library. So all staff are invited, any staff, reference staff, metadata staff, whoever. And they can come and they'll receive training on any wide number of things. So RDA training for reference specifically is included in those training sessions. And um, 
that's appearing ahead of us implementing RDA, rolling it out for our catalogers, however, in this hybrid environment where there's OCLC records and our records commingling in ACR2 and RDA.